afternoon and welcome to everybody who's here today and we also welcome those who are listening online or via the telephone. Um, we have no announcements and the call to worship we are going to use is from Psalm 68. Psalm 68 verse 20. Our God is the God of salvation and a God to the and to God the Lord belong escape, escapes from death. And to God the Lord belong escapes from death. Let us respond by singing from our songbooks A1. All three stanzas. I also introduce uh, Marty Wagner is going to uh, make you, Pastor Marty Wagner is going to be leading us in service this afternoon.
Beloved congregation, as we draw near to the Lord in worship, we do so confessing that our help is in the name of the Lord, who has made the heavens and the earth. Amen. Receive the Lord's greeting. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, through our Lord Jesus Christ, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's sing now together Psalter 251, all three stanzas titled Joyful Worship, Psalter 251, 1, 2, and 3. Our scripture reading for this afternoon's service is found in the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 26. I'd like to read verses 47 through 56. At my church in Zion, uh, we've been working through Matthew 26 uh, this Passion season. And earlier in this chapter, just to set the context for you, you'll find as you're reading this passage uh, the willingness of God and especially of Christ to save sinners. Over and over again, uh, you find that, verses 31 through 35, the Father's willingness to strike the shepherd instead of striking the sinner, and the, sheep, uh, the shepherd's willingness to lay down his life for his sheep. Then you get to the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane in, chap- in verses 36 to 46. And again, there you see the willing Savior, the, the Savior who presses through the most intense uh, threat and fear. He's facing the cup, and yet he's willing to take that cup for his people. And now here, this afternoon, we're focusing on verses 47 through 56, and not so much on Christ, but the warning of Judas. And so that's what we're looking at this afternoon. We'll read verses 47 through 56. And while Jesus was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, 
He is the one that sees him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. But Jesus said to him, Friend, why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And suddenly one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. But Jesus said to him, Put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he will provide me with more than twelve legions of angels? Once again, there's the willing Savior, twelve legions of angels. That's 72,000 angels Jesus could have called down. How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? In that hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you, teaching in the temple, and you did not seize me. But all this was done, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Thus far, the reading of God's holy, infallible, and precious word, may he write its eternal truths upon our hearts. Let's turn to our faithful God now in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we have begun our worship by singing that it is good to sing your praises. And it is good to thank you, O Most High. And Lord, truly, it is good You are the Most High God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are the King of the universe. And Lord, as our Creator and our daily provider, we all have received countless blessings from your hands. Lord, every single one of us, whoever we are, our lives are a testimony of your kindness towards us. Lord, many of us are going through trials. We have many difficulties And yet, Lord, even those of us with the worst of trials, and we do not deny those trials, even those of us there in that place have received thousands and thousands and thousands of blessings, gifts from your hand. Father, you are the Father of lights, and every good and every perfect gift comes from above. Lord, we often miss the gifts that you give us. We don't think about them, uh, the gift of life the gift of breath, the gift of being able to walk or to talk or to think or to move our hands and and to, to be able to have clothes and food and homes and cars. Lord, you have showered us with so many blessings. And so it is good, it is right, it is fitting, it is pleasing to give thanks unto you, O Most High. And Lord, for your people, you have given us the greatest of gifts. Father, you have given us your Son. And in giving us your Son, you've given us eternal life. Already now, we have eternal life through your Spirit. For this is eternal life, to know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And Father, we we know you by your Spirit. We have fellowship with you with you through the Son. And this is our joy this afternoon, that we can draw near unto you a good Father. And we can stand accepted in the Beloved before you. And we can worship you in spirit and in truth. And we can rejoice in all the privileges that you have given to your people. And Lord, what privileges those are. As we sung, you have filled our hearts with gladness. Lord, only the Christian is the one who has true joy. And yet, Lord, even as your people, so often we live far beneath our privileges. Uh, We set Christ out of mind. We set what he has done for us out of mind. And we live often as if we're orphans who are forsaken in this world. We live as if we don't have a good father in heaven. And Lord, we do this to your dishonor and to our own pain. And so, Holy Spirit, we pray that in this time of worship, that you would be 
revealing to your people again all that we have in Christ, all that we possess in this mighty, willing Savior, this one who loves his bride and so who gave himself for her, this one who willingly took that crown of thorns upon his head so that we might bear the crown of glory for eternity, that we might reign with him forever. Lord, help us, your people, to to see our future, that we would see that there is a day coming when we will be planted in your presence forever. And Lord, we long for that day, and this uh, time of worship is a foretaste of our heavenly worship, of our enjoyment of the new heavens and the new earth, where you will give us meaningful work, where we will serve you, but also where we will worship you like we've never worshipped before, where we will cast our crowns before the Lamb and say, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Lord, help us to see the hope that we have and help us to long for that day. Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Lord, we confess that in this life, uh, even as your people, we so often live with so little fruit. And Lord, this, this grieves your people. Uh, we confess this. We, we grieve over this. We long for more fruit. Help us, Lord Jesus, to abide in the vine. And by abiding in you, that your spirit might flow through us. And that we would trust then also that we would bear much fruit to the glory of the Father. Lord, it's also easy for your people to not see our fruit, the the work of the Spirit in our lives. And we pray then that you would help those of us who live in in constant anxiety of, of their spiritual condition or other worries. Lord, help us to see more of the Spirit's work in our lives that we might rejoice in what Christ has done for us, but also what the Spirit has done for us, uh, taking out that heart of stone, giving us a heart of flesh that, that loves Christ, that pants after Christ, and that seeks to live in obedience to Christ. But Lord, also as we hear of Judas this afternoon, Lord, we pray that you would give us the grace to, to be able to hear this warning that your spirit would apply this warning to each heart according to our needs. Lord, if there are hypocrites in our midst, we pray, O God, that you would uncover such now before it's too late, and that this warning would be a means of grace in their life to drive them to the Lord Jesus Christ, the willing Savior. And Lord, for your people, that you would expose for us the hypocrisy that does live in all of our hearts, that we might cast it off, that we might see it for what it is and grieve over it and hate it and bring it to Christ to have it covered in the blood, but also that your spirit might stir us up with greater resolve to exercise ourselves unto godliness. Lord, help us then to make good use of of what we've read here and of what we're about to hear. Lord, we pray that your spirit would apply uh, this word to us. Please remove distractions, remove tiredness. Help us to keep the main things in view. Help us to see eternity. Help us to know that heaven is real, that hell is real, that we have never dying souls, and that there is a real Savior for real sinners. And so, Lord, may we cling to him, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we also lift up the various struggles of our church family, there are many, no doubt, that are unknown, but also many that uh, we bear together. Lord, in particular, we think of uh, Mr. Hans Trelau as he was uh, hospitalized yesterday, brought to West Lincoln. And um, Lord, we pray that you would care for him as he has viral pneumonia and he's been disoriented in the last day. Lord, please uh, provide for his needs. We pray that you would give him peace at this time, that you would be near to him, that you would sanctify this trial unto him and to his family. Lord, that in the midst of this, that they would find you are faithful to your promises. And Lord, we also do pray for your healing, trusting your good plan. Lord, we bring all of our burdens before you. 
trusting that you are a good father for us. Lord, we also pray for uh, churches wherever they are. We thank you for gospel preachers wherever you've sent them. Help them to faithfully herald the word today. And Lord, that you would build your church. Uh, We praise you for this beautiful promise that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Because King Jesus, you are almighty and you are doing your work even today. And so, Lord, do that work among us. Do that work in our land. We pray for reviving. We pray for your spirit to be poured out in these days of darkness. We pray for our leaders and for our nation. Lord, we thank you for the freedoms that we enjoy. We have so many privileges. And yet, Lord, we see the darkness that is spreading in our land. And we pray, O God, that you would turn our hearts unto you and that you would begin this work with us, that you would humble us, that you would make us God-centered people and Christ-centered people more and more each day. Lord, we also pray that uh, you would continue to cause your people to abound in hope that we might press on in the callings you've given us. Lord, we come to you confessing our sin. We come to you confessing our neediness, and yet we come to you seeing that you are a good Father who delights to give your Spirit to those who ask. And so, Father, pour out your Spirit now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Beloved well, congregation, at this time we have the opportunity to worship the Lord with the giving of our gifts. And following that, we'd like to sing Psalter 113. Stanzas 5, 6, 8, and 11. And as we sing 113, uh, see Christ in these words because verses 5, 6, and 8, they reveal to us the sufferings of Christ as his friend, the betrayer, rises up against him. But then verse 11, we find his confidence uh, in his Father. So Psalter 113, 5, 6, 8, and 11.
Beloved congregation, I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles again to Matthew chapter 26. I'd like to read verses 48 through the first half of verse 50. Matthew 26, verses 48 through 50. Now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. But Jesus said to him, Friend, why have you come? Dear congregation, sadly, it's a too regular experience to read in the news headlines about major church leaders falling to scandal or deconstructing, that's the word used today, deconstructing their faith. We read that too often, unfortunately, and we all all know some of the names. I I imagine some are coming to your mind right now as as I just mentioned this. Uh, Ravi Zacharias, Joshua Harris, Bruxy Cavey, we could go on, there's many. Many who profess the name of Christ, even more than that, those who are public leaders in the church, who in the end reveal their true colors. Uh, In fact, uh, just this week, this is the perfect illustration, I can't let it pass, just in God's providence. This week, I was at a coffee shop overhearing two complete strangers, didn't know who they were, and they were talking about this very fact. Uh, They were talking about, let's Let's try to list the names of popular evangelists who haven't yet fallen into scandal. This was their conversation. And my ears are burning as I'm writing this sermon. And sadly, to our shame, you might say, they said, let's come up with a list of those who haven't yet fallen because that's a shorter list. Let's not list those um, who've had scandals because that list is too long. Let's try to think of popular evangelists, popular Christians who have not yet had a scandal. That list is shorter, so let's go there. Obviously, this is a devastating disgrace to the honor of Christ, and yet it's nothing new, beloved. It's nothing new, because the Bible warns us this will happen. In fact, this afternoon, we are considering the supreme example in Scripture of the wolf in sheep's clothing. We are considering the example of Judas, the betrayer. And congregation, what a warning this is. Uh, Judas is the ultimate paradigm of someone professing Christ with their lips and yet not possessing Christ by faith in their heart. Uh, Judas is a warning of how close someone can be to the kingdom of heaven and yet still go to an eternal hell. Judas is a classic example of a hypocrite. Now, children, that word hypocrite, maybe you've, you know this already, but in the Greek, hypocrite is just the word that's used for actor. So if you're talking about a play back in Jesus' time, there would be actors involved in that play, and they'd be the hypocrites. They're the actors. It's just a word for actor. And Jesus, though, takes that word and says, this is what many do in religion. They act. And in Christ's day, again, those in plays, they would, if you were the happy character in the story, you'd wear a mask that that had the smile. And if you're the the sad character in the story, you would put on a mask with a frown. And Jesus is saying, "This this is what the Pharisees are. This is what Judas is, someone who's wearing a mask. And their whole life is but one big show. And so, congregation, this is a warning we must consider for ourselves Jesus is very plain in his teaching. As long as the church is in this world, as long as the visible church is present in this world, it will be made up of wheat and tares. That is, true professors and false professors. And so which one are we? That's an important question. Which one are we? The main point of the sermon is to warn us of this one grave reality, and it's this, 
we can go through all of the outward motions of religion, we can give off all the appearances that we love Christ, when in reality, we hate him and our hearts are far from him. That's Judas. This afternoon, we're looking here at Matthew 26, 47 through 50. And what I want us to see is that in this climactic scene of Judas's betrayal of Christ, it's really here a snapshot or, or a picture that summarizes for us in one moment, in one frame, it summarizes for us the whole life of Judas. Because here we find, on one hand, Judas kissing Christ. He's, he's showing outward affection, you might say, for this Christ. And yet at the same time, behind that kiss, motivating that kiss, is hatred in his heart. He wants to kill him. And that's Judas's life. And so that's what we want to consider this afternoon. The betrayer's kiss. We have two points. First of all, kissing Christ. And secondly, killing Christ. Firstly, kissing Christ. Notice verse 47. And while Jesus was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and the elders of the people. And so here we meet Judas. And, and what we're doing here is we're asking, well, who is this man? Who is this betrayer? Let's Let's see some of the outward appearances of love for Christ in his life. We can start with his name, Judas. It's, it's a good Jewish name, and although if we look around, I don't think there's any Judases here. It's not a name we give to our children for good reason. But in, in his day, it was a popular name. It's, it's just Judah in Greek. It's the Greek form of Judah, and Judah was one of the tribes of Israel. And so this reminds us, Judas, Judas was a covenant child. He grew up in the covenant community, and his parents gave him a good name, a name that means God be thanked or God be praised. Elsewhere in the Gospels, he's known as Judas Iscariot. Now, Iscariot, that comes from two Hebrew words being put together, uh, ish, which means man in Hebrew, and Kerioth, which was a small town that was south of Jerusalem. And, and so you put it together, he's a man of, Jerus uh, of Kerioth, just like Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, Judas Iscariot, a man from Kerioth. And so it's quite striking then, what we notice here about Judas is that the other 11 disciples, they all came from the despised northern regions of Galilee, and this one disciple, well, at least we get the hints, that he came from the south, uh, closer to Jerusalem, in the place where you might say he's He's more privileged. He's closer to the heart and center of religion in his day. Well, there's three things I want to highlight about Judas that illustrates how he displays all the right appearances of loving Christ. First of all, notice he was a close companion to Christ. He was a close companion to Christ. You see that in our text. It says, Judas, this is verse 47, Judas is one of the twelve. Now, congregation, this is remarkable. Uh, Judas, the betrayer of Christ, is one of the inner band. Uh, he's, he's one of the closest followers of Christ in this day. Uh, throughout Jesus' ministry, he had attracted large crowds. Uh, at times, there were crowds that were uh, filling the fields. They're waiting to, to be fed from bread of heaven. Give us bread. Judas isn't in that crowd. He's in the inner circle. He's one of the chosen ones, one of the chosen disciples. And so just think of what that means. Just like for Peter, or for James, or for John, or for Levi, or for Philip, there was a day and time when Jesus came up to Judas and said, drop everything and follow me. And Judas did. He did. He left his house in Kerioth. He moved away. And he left his friends. He left his family. He left his work. And for three years now, he's been wandering around with Jesus, day after day, living life with Christ. To state this more simply, Judas was one of Christ's best friends and closest companions. This is why when Judas approaches Jesus in verse 49 here, he can greet him with a kiss. 
Uh, this was a kiss that was on the cheek. It was a common greeting in the Middle East for dear friends, close friends. You greet one another with a kiss. It's a sign of intimacy and, and friendship and close companionship, close friendship. And, and this isn't the first time Judas then is kissing Jesus. No, there's, he was a friend of Christ. And, and so this speaks of, of how he would ordinarily greet Jesus. They were friends, close companions. And Jesus says as much in verse 50. You see that? Friend. Friend. Matthew Henry writes, Judas was familiar with Jesus and favored by Jesus. He was one of Jesus' family, as it were, one of those with whom he was intimately conversant. He had close conversation. They were close companions. Wherever Jesus went, Judas was welcome with him. And so if you're looking in, in your town, maybe you're looking for Judas that day, you'd say, where's Judas? Have you seen Judas? Oh, he's with Jesus. Of course he is. He's always with Jesus. That was Judas' life for three years. And notice here in our text, Judas is so familiar with Jesus and the patterns of Jesus' life, he knows exactly where to find him. He takes this band of soldiers. He says, you can trust me. I know where Jesus is. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I know this because I, I've spent lots of time there with him. We, we would go there to talk. We would go there to pray. We would go there to talk about Scripture. Judas was one of the twelve and therefore one of Christ's closest companions. Well, what does this mean for us? This tells us that we can be within close proximity to Christ and not have Christ. We can always be with Jesus, as it were, and yet not actually have Jesus. We can come to, to church where Jesus is preached and, and the means of grace are enjoyed and how the Spirit loves to use the means of grace to bring Christ home to our souls, and yet you can be here where Jesus is and yet never come to Jesus. We can go to Bible studies where Jesus is talked about and yet not have Jesus. We can give off appearances of going to Jesus in prayer and yet not actually be speaking to Jesus in prayer. But it actually gets more striking for us as we look at Judas. He wasn't only a close companion of Christ, but he was also, secondly, a powerful preacher. He was a powerful preacher. Notice Matthew in our text intentionally reminds us that Judas is one of the twelve. And earlier in his gospel, he's introduced us to these twelve. If you uh, turn with me to Matthew chapter 10, just go back a few pages to Matthew 10. Verses 2 through 4 of Matthew 10, you find the list of the disciples. And notice, Jesus is there, verse 4, Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. But go back to verse 1 now of chapter 10, and look at what it says. And when Jesus had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of disease. And so isn't that amazing? Jesus doesn't just give power to the eleven. He gives power to the twelve. Judas also receives this power. And so the disciples go out two by two, and just like the other eleven, Judas has power. He has power to cast out unclean spirits. He has power to heal all kinds of sicknesses. He has power to preach, just like the rest of them. Power given to him by Christ. Now, congregation, sometimes maybe we can be a little naive and think we can easily spot a fraud, and, and we can sometimes. I mean, you turn on your TV, you see these TV evangelists, and you can spot a fraud. I mean, please spot the fraud. But other times, it's not so obvious. Nobody suspected Judas. You would listen to his sermons, and since he was speaking true things, things that he had received from Jesus and now is delivering them in his sermons, the truth could touch your heart as he preached. 
And so as Judas went out, people would come up to him after the sermon and say, Judas, great sermon. Powerful message today. And so congregation, here's the point for us. It's possible to do powerful things in Christ's name and not have Christ. It's possible to possess great gifts and yet not possess saving grace. And so what a warning Judas is. And and beloved, the Spirit has given this warning in all warnings of Scripture for our good. I wonder how you treat the warnings of Scripture. Uh, maybe, maybe we shrink back from warnings. We don't like to hear them, and I understand that. We'd, we'd rather hear the promises. We want to hear the promises, and we need to hear the promises. Of course. That's right. That's good. The Spirit has given us the promises, which all Jesus fills them. Yes and amen. They're complete in Him. So the promises are given for our good. But beloved, the warnings are given for our good as well. And I wonder, have you learned to make use of the warnings? Whether it's the warning of a Bible text, or maybe the warning of an example that you see lived out by someone in your life. Are you making use of the warnings that God gives you? I know for myself, I have one or two former preachers that are forever lodged in my mind. I can't forget them, and I hope I won't forget them, not because that they have been faithful to Christ, but because of the opposite. They've made shipwreck of their faith. And as I think of these men, and one in particular, one who who could speak so freely of Christ, and, and one who ministered for Christ, and yet you look at the way he ended his ministry in utter shambles, it makes me shudder. And it should, because it's saying, guard your heart. Friend, are you using the warnings that God places in your life to help you guard your heart, to keep a close watch, to be alert? Judas is such a warning for us. But not only was he a close companion and a powerful preacher, but third, Judas was also a trusted treasurer. Do you notice that? He's, he's the trusted treasurer. He's not just one of the disciples. He is that But John 12, amazingly, tells us Judas held the bag. Do you know what that means? That means that as the other disciples carried out their ministry, they're going through ministry, and they're starting to get collections, and hey, this is how we, you know, the money comes in, that gives us something to eat, that gives us clothes to wear, that gives us money to give to the poor, and so this is important. We need someone we can trust to to carry the bag. We need someone who's responsible, someone who's respected, and in their mind, Judas. And so they nominate him. Judas is the trusted treasurer. And this tells us, again, we can hold positions in Christ's church and yet not have Christ. It's possible. We can have respect in the eyes of men. The appearances can all be good And yet, beloved, we can be a fraud. We can be like a chameleon that changes colors just to blend in. We can can learn all of the right religious language, all the right religious behavior, and so fit in in such a way that no one else suspects us. Charles, Charles Spurgeon once said, The hypocrite is very often an exceedingly neat imitation of the Christian. To the common observer... He is so good a counterfeit that he entirely escapes suspicion. Friend, is that you? Are you a Christian chameleon? One who just tries to to blend in. Are you like Judas, uh, kissing Jesus, as it were, giving outward signs of affection for him, and yet in reality, there's no love. No love. Are you playing the game of religion? Are you wearing the mask? Beloved, friend, when will the mask come off? Will it be the judgment day? You stand before the throne? Take it off today. 
That's the Spirit's purpose with bringing us this passage, this warning from the life of Judas. See what's at stake and examine yourself. And if this is you, don't stay in that place. Well, first of all, that's kissing Christ. But let's go to our second point, killing Christ. Killing Christ. Notice verse 48 of Matthew 26. Now, his betrayer had given them, that's the great multitude with all their swords and clubs, he had given them a sign saying, whomever I kiss, he is the one, seize him. And immediately he went up to Jesus and said, greetings, rabbi, and he kissed him. And so, congregation, here we see beyond the surface to the core. Here we're seeing the reality of who Judas was. So far, we've highlighted how a hypocrite can blend in. To man's eye, it's, it's hard to discern between the wheat and the tares. And just as a, as a practical aside, we aren't called to live with this hyper-suspicion about everyone else around us. That's not the point of this. No, uh, we, we give one another, we extend to one another the judgment of charity uh, on the basis of their profession of faith, on the basis of their life, and yet we submit to church discipline when necessary. So this isn't calling us to be hyper-suspicious, can't trust anyone, can't trust our leaders because there's a Judas. It's not calling for that. This is directed at our hearts, each one of us personally. Is it I? So the hypocrite can blend in because we see the externals, but now in this point, we want to see Judas from God's perspective. God looks on the heart. He knows the reality. And so here, in this point, I want to highlight, this is our final point, I want to highlight three realities about Judas that led him on this trajectory of killing Christ. And what what we're asking here really is, what's wrong with Judas? What's gone wrong in his life? And the first thing, Judas' greatest problem is his unchanged heart. His unchanged heart. That's, That's the crux of the matter. Externally, here was a man who gave off many outward appearances of being a Christian, and yet, at his core, here was someone who is diametrically opposed to Christ, and therefore the furthest thing from being a true believer. And so, beloved, don't miss this point. Externally, yes, it's hard for us to see the difference, maybe, between the wheat and the tares, and yet what we need to realize is the radical difference internally between the true Christian and the hypocrite. Uh, They are worlds apart because the one loves Christ and the other hates Christ. Listen to Jesus' blunt statement in John 6. We'll be moving around the Bible a little bit in this second point, so if you want to follow along. John 6, verse 70 Listen to what Christ says about Judas, and it highlights the radical distinction between the true believer and the hypocrite. John 6, verse 70, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. That's strong language from the lips of Jesus. Now, it's not that Judas was literally the devil, but what Jesus is saying is that Judas is so ensnared in the devil's kingdom. He's still under the tyranny of Satan. His whole heart is given to Satan. Judas never received a new heart. He was never born from above, so he was still dead in his sin. His life was still under the power and dominion of sin. Turn with me now to John 8. John 8, verse 42 Jesus now has hard words for the Pharisees, another group of, of hypocrites. Judas was probably there, though, to hear this. John eight forty two, If God were your father, you would love me. Do you hear that? Love. If God were your father, if you were born from above, you would love me. But notice verse 40, But now you seek to kill me. And verse 44, You are of your father the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. Congregation, Jesus is very clear. Here he is speaking to 
covenant people. And he has the boldness to say, because they're rejecting him, your father is Satan. This is how we come into the world in Adam. Left to ourselves, our heart is hard. Satan is our father. Ephesians 2 tells us that as well, verses 1 through 3. And here's Judas, and he remained in that condition. Here is a religious man with an unchanged heart. And friends, how easy it is to be one of those. Jonathan Edwards writes this. We can be sober, orderly, and a good sort of people, and yet be as dry as bones. And there he's putting the finger on the problem. The problem is deadness of heart. And the hypocrite never sees the true depth of their problem. They think, I just need to rearrange a few things in my life. This was the Pharisee, one of the Pharisees' problems was that they kept pulling out the whitewash and putting it on the sepulcher. And Jesus says, no, we don't need whitewash. We need life. There's bones in here. It's dead. The hypocrite doesn't see it. I can fix this. I can manage this. And yet all along, they're just rearranging the bones. We need life. We need supernatural, spiritual life. Judas didn't have that spirit worked root in his life, and so all of the fruit was rotten. And actually, as we take a closer look, if we examine Judas's life a little closer, it, this becomes more and more evident. Judas's heart was occupied by idols, and in particular, he was enslaved to money. John 12, verse 6, tells us Judas was a thief, and he used to take what was put into the money box, and so just think about that. Here is a man with a major heart problem. Uh, he is ruled by money and greed and envy. And so it leads to this double life. Yes, trusted treasure by day, thief by night. When others are looking, he's a Christ's close companion. When yet, yet when eyes are turned away, he's plotting, how can I kill this Christ? That's the first thing. The problem is the unchanged heart. But second, notice the unheeded warnings. The unheeded warnings. And here I want to illustrate how hard Judas's heart had become. Just saying, Judas sat for three years under the best ministry in the world. He heard Jesus, the Son of God, preach sermon after sermon after sermon with authority. And yet he refused to believe. If you go back to John 6 verse 64. John 6, verse 64. Jesus says this, first verse 63, the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Verse 64, but there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And so, beloved, see these words. In John 6, in the bigger context, Jesus is abundantly clear. Salvation is 100% of God. We need it to be that way if there's going to be any life. If God doesn't do the work, none are saved. And yet, notice here, Jesus is equally clear. Judas is responsible for his unbelief. Do you see that? My words are spirit. They are life. There are some of you who do not believe. Judas, you just won't believe. You don't want to believe. You, you won't listen and, and embrace this. And so we shouldn't feel sorry for Judas as if he's some sort of innocent man, some sort of innocent pawn. No, he was a wicked man whose heart was set on evil. He wouldn't listen to the Word, the one who is the Word of God. Now, to illustrate this, just think of all of his exercises of unbelief. Jesus heard this, or Judas heard the Sermon on the Mount probably multiple times because Jesus was a traveling evangelist and the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, is, these are the main themes that Jesus is preaching and preaching and preaching as he goes from place to place. 
And so just think with me through the Sermon of the Mount. Judas heard Christ's description of a true believer. Blessed are the poor in spirit, not proud, but the spiritually broken ones, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, who grieve over sin, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Judas heard Christ's warnings of a a hypocrite. Matthew 6, verse 1. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Judas, take heed. Don't let your religion just be a show. Judas heard Christ's warnings about being a slave to money. Matthew 6, 21. Judas, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. Judas, you cannot serve God and money. Judas heard Christ's warnings about, a false, about false prophets. Matthew seven fifteen. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Judas, consider the fruits of your life. Judas heard Christ's warning about false professors. Matthew seven twenty one. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? Judas, that's you. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, you who are in the process of killing me, the son of righteousness. Congregation, Judas heard Jesus teach on all these things, and yet he left the warnings unheeded. Friend, are you doing the same? I imagine Judas may have trembled as Christ preached at different times. But to tremble is not enough. James 2, 19, the demons tremble. Judas trembled, but he never turned from his hypocrisy. And beloved, the true Christian, by the Spirit's grace, learns to turn and to turn and to turn again from their hypocrisy. The Christian, the true Christian, agrees with Jesus, Lord, this is me. And if you're a believer here this afternoon, I imagine you're saying that, Lord, this is me, this hurts. This is exposing me. And yet, beloved, that's because we all have Judas-like hypocrisy tendencies in us. And yet here's the difference. Judas wouldn't own up to it. And the believer does. The believer says, Jesus, I agree with you. This is me. I'm sorry for who, you, for who I am. I hate what I've done. And so Jesus, here I come with my hypocr- hypocrisy. Here I come with my sham religion, and I renounce it. Beloved, this is how a warning message can actually lead to greater confidence in Christ. Because as you start to be exposed, you also see, I I hate what I've done to Jesus. I hate how I deny him. I hate my hypocrisy. And I'm confessing it. And we don't do that of ourselves. That's the Spirit's blessed work in us. When we take it to Christ, when we say, Jesus, you are a sufficient Savior for me. And so there's genuine repentance in the believer. We're grieved over our own hypocrisy. We're saying, Lord, save me. Lord, wash me. Lord, forgive me. Lord, change me. And if that's us today, then what assurance we can have because Jesus is there saying, I will be clean. I love to save such. I've died for such. Come to me with your sin. I love to save Peter's. Peter who flees from me. Peter who denies me. I love to restore him. I love to save Thomas's who are doubting. 
I love to restore him. I love to give him greater assurance that he is mine. Come to me with your hypocrisy. And I will declare my love to you. So Christian, let this warning sermon lead you back to Christ. Let this warning sermon lead you to turn from your sin and to strengthen your confidence in him. Unfortunately, we don't see that in Judas. He never dealt with his hypocrisy. And beloved, how many good intentions are snuffed out due to putting something off for a more convenient time? I can repent later. I can deal with it later. I, can, I'm, I will get old. I can deal with it then. As if we have that confidence. And as if, as if we know how to repent. If you haven't repented your whole life, why do you think you'll be able to do it on your deathbed? Today. Today is the day of salvation. Judas never considered his soul, and so his heart got harder until he was easy pickings for Satan. And this is the final thing I want to show us here. The unguarded life. The unguarded life. What led Judas to commit the most evil crime in the universe of rejecting the Messiah? Well, John 13, if you go to John 13, has this striking statement. Verse 2 John 13, verse 2 says, here in the context of, of Jesus enjoying the, the, you know, the supper, the final supper with his disciples, and if, if you go to verse 21, just see that first, maybe you see the trouble in Jesus' heart over his friend Judas betraying him. Isn't that amazing love? It troubled him. And yet look at verse 2. We have this striking statement. The devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray him. And my question is, when did Satan do that? When did Judas give Satan a foothold so that it would lead him to this point? His whole life long, he's, he's playing Christianity, he's living this act, and yet at some point, Satan enters him in an ultimate way. When did that happen? Well, if you're reading all the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, then you get the picture and you recognize that something dramatic happens at the anointing of Jesus at Bethany. That's the tipping point for Judas. Uh, It's there that Judas says, that's it, I'm not following Jesus any longer, I'm deconstructing. And you find that in chapter 12, right before this. So that's where we'll finish our message, John 12. Notice, It's the final week of Christ's earthly life. He's, Jesus has just raised Lazarus from the dead. Judas saw it with his own eyes, an amazing miracle. And now Jesus is eating supper at Lazarus' house. And, and children, you remember how Mary, she comes in with this pound of costly oil of spikenard and all of this perfume, and uh, she takes it and she anoints Christ's feet with it. And she wipes his feet with her hair. And, and Jesus tells us that Mary does this for his burial. Jesus is telling us that Mary sees something that that the rest of the disciples have missed, that her Savior is a dying Savior for her. He's going to die. So she wants to anoint him before he does that act. And so out of love, she pours out an abundance of costly perfume on him, and Judas is watching this outpouring of love, and he can't stand it. You see that in verse 4? Judas sees it happening, and he exclaims, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? And so what a hypocrite. Do you hear the religious language? Think about the poor. Sounds so good. And it's 300 denarii. That's a huge amount of money. Uh, It's an average yearly salary. We could take 2023 and pour it on Jesus' feet. That's what Mary's doing. Whole year on Jesus' feet. Whole salary. Judas sees it, and he can't stand it. Verse 6, not because he cared about the poor, but he cared about himself. He was a thief. And so, just think about what Judas is actually saying here as he objects. Don't waste this costly perfume on Jesus. 
he's not worth it. See where his heart is? Money is better than the Messiah. Money is better than this man. Just think about it. Judas values the perfume at 300 denarii. He knows how much money this is. He he sees that evaluation. And yet, in our text, Matthew 26, he sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. This perfume is way more precious to Judas than Jesus. Jesus is the price of a common slave. Just, Just get rid of him. I don't need him anymore. And doesn't that show you the true nature of his heart? He's never come under the blessed lordship of Christ. He's never submitted himself before his master. He never stood with his hand over his mouth, as it were, guilty before God and saying, Jesus, I need you as my savior. His whole life, he was trying to manipulate his master, just trying to get Jesus under his control. And now that Jesus isn't doing the messianic thing that he wanted, like getting rid of the Romans, I'm going to trade him in. I'm going to sell him off for the price of a slave. And beloved, this is the final mark, you might say, of the hypocrite that we've been pressing all along. The hypocrite has no love for Christ. This is their evaluation. There can be lots of religion, lots of activity, lots of words, but no love for Christ. And so, friends, there's the test for us. What do you think of Christ? Do you love this one? And maybe you say, well, I love him. I don't love him enough. I wish I loved him more. I wish there was more love in my heart. And friend, if you're saying that, that tells you you've seen something of his worth because you're recognizing your love for him is pitiful and he deserves more. Praise God, the Spirit is here and he's opened your eyes to the glory of Christ. Judas has no love, so he goes to the garden. He looks Jesus in the face. He kisses him in order to kill him. That's how hardened he was. He can get that close with such evil intentions. And Jesus asks, friend, why are you here? That's the closing question. Friend, why are you here? Why have you come to church this afternoon? Why are you here? What's your religion? What's it all about? Why are you here? Is, are you here because you love this Savior and you want to glorify him? He, he's worthy of my worship. It's good to praise him. I want to see more of him. I need him then praise God, the Spirit has worked in your life. And if that's not why you're here, if there's any other reason for why you're here, then come to the Savior today and find that he is a willing Savior. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, how you suffered for sinners that even one of your closest companions would turn on you and you would take this. Eternal Son of God, you left heaven, the glories of heaven, to be the man of sorrows. And here we've seen a glimpse of your sorrows that you willingly took upon yourself to save sinners. And Lord Jesus, we praise you for your spirit who makes sinners alive and that there are many here in this place who Rejoice in you, Lord Jesus, who put no confidence in the flesh and all of this because of the Spirit's grace. And Lord, help us then to know that we have a Savior who holds us fast to the very end. And Lord, we pray that where you've been convicting us, that we would confess our sin, that we would come to you for covering, that we would find that you are faithful to your promises that you truly forgive. And Lord, for any Judases who may be listening, that they would turn, that they would take off the mask before it's too late, and that they would discover what true life is in Christ. Lord, forgive us for our sins in worship. Be with us in the rest of this day. We thank you for it, and we pray that you would give us uh, strength for the week ahead, and may your word Uh, guide us, and may the love of Christ constrain us to live more for your glory. Amen. At this time of congregation, we'd like to recite together the words of the Apostles' Creed, confessing
with the church of all ages and all places, uh, the true Christian faith, where we answer that question, Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our closing Psalter is Psalter 426, 1 and 5, here singing of the Lord's sovereign grace, grace that truly saves. benediction will sing for doxology may the grace of christ the savior receive the lord's blessing and go to your homes and into this week in peace the grace of the lord jesus christ and the love of god the father and the fellowship of the holy spirit be with you all amen, amen.